Good evening. Uh, this is the second day of the Best of Soho. I have the great pleasure of, uh, of discussing the Best of AML uh, today and I have with me two very distinguished guests. guests. Dr. Farhad Ravandi is a professor at MD Anderson Cancer Institute uh, and uh, Dr. Courtney DiNardo, who is also with the Leukemia Department. And both of them are here to discuss some of the, uh, the highlights of the presentations today. Welcome, both of you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. So Dr. Ravandi, I'll start with you. You chaired the session today and I guess you saw a lot of very elegant presentation, the evolving landscape of AML. And you even summarized it in your first presentation. So where do you see things going considering what was presented today? As you mentioned, I presented in the first talk that uh, I think we are making a lot of progress. Um, there was a question about uh, not having made a lot of progress, but I think over the last 10, 15 years, we are beginning to make progress, mainly because we are understanding AML better and we also have more effective agents. Uh, we have really entirely relied on uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy, not only just for AML, but all cancers for the last uh, 60 years since Dr. Freireich started uh, combining some of these agents in pediatric ALL. And of course, that was very successful at the time. And with over the years, we've been able to uh, modify these for various diseases. In AML, I mentioned, as I mentioned, I like to think of it as very simply two types of disease. One is cytotoxic chemotherapy mm -hmm. sensitive, and one is chemo resistant. And with a sensitive disease, as long as the patient can tolerate it, you can intensify the treatment and get better results. With a resistant disease, and, and also in the older patients who cannot tolerate intensification, we need new strategies. And understanding the AML, finding these sub specific subsets, these effective agents, uh, like the drugs that Dr. Uh, uh, DiNardo and Dr. Stein uh, d discussed, I think we're going to have a lot of excitement over the near uh, several years in AML, the same way as we're seeing it in CLL or ALL or CML and other hematological malignancies. Excellent. I, I think that's a very good way to put it, uh, to defining AML into chemo-sensitive and chemo-resistant disease. And I guess it goes back to if you can predict those who will become chemo-resistant up beforehand in terms of the biology mm -hmm. and some of the markers. I think with the DCGA data, we have uh, 13 mutations, and I think of them, the actionable ones that you, you can talk about. And right. I think there's never been a more kind of... To jump on what you were saying, never been a more exciting time to be in leukemia research than right now because we really are finally getting a really good handle on what makes up these different AML. And AML is not just a single disease, right? There are, um, in, uh, in addition to cytogenetic abnormalities, all these various different um, uh, genetic mutations that can happen in various different combinations. And um, FLT3 inhibitors, of course, were the first that uh, have come down the pipeline in terms of having various different effective FLT3 inhibitor strategies, we heard about quite a few of them today, and, um, and I've been involved most particularly in the IDH1 and IDH2 inhibitors, which um, uh, a, uh, IDH mutations are present in about 20% of, of AML, of course, and so uh, we now have a very viable and effective uh, treatment option for, for those patients as well. And I'll probably quickly jump to IDH1 uh, before we get to the other uh, areas, mm -hmm. and I think uh, both you and Dr. Stein uh, mm -hmm. shared some very exciting data from a phase one perspective and also uh, uh, that IDH1 and 2 are not necessarily found or mutations and the fact that you need to screen for them repeatedly. Correct. I think that's a really important point that um, is just now coming to light. The community has thought that IDH is always a founder mutation similar to um, uh, DNMT3A, TET2, for example, and that uh, if you didn't have it at diagnosis, it wasn't going to pop up over time with various different, uh, you know, throughout the life of that patient. But that's actually not, not true. Sometimes, about a third of the time, it's found at the beginning and, and based on the clonal architecture, it seems to be one of the, the first um, uh, clonal events. But, but about two-thirds of the time, it's not, and it can be acquired, and especially in MDS and, and uh, myeloproliferative neoplasm patients that go on to progress to a more um, aggressive AML type um, situation it can more than 10 percent of the time it can be and present and it appears that from a lot of the work I mean uh, who 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 would not agree or who, do, who would disagree that APL was the first targeted uh, 
a, a disease that came about with atra and arsenic, but mm -hmm. now you're already defining another subset of patients, the IDH2, and not uh, very dissimilar from the APL patients in terms of the clinical phenotype when you described those uh, retrospective analysis. Um, it, is, it is true that, um, uh, that, that treatment with the IDH inhibitors tend to cause an almost APL-like differentiation syndrome, uh, you know, very, very reminiscent of that. Um, certainly different in the sense that, that treatment with the IDH inhibitors, you actually never lose the IDH clone, which has been very interesting, and, and we don't have a lot of, of data behind this yet, but as we're, as we're learning, looking at the different allelic burdens of the IDH mutations, they don't disappear. So as these patients are, um, are differentiating and maturing into these kind of functional neutrophils, they, they have not lost the mutation at all. Um, it's still present. So, um, so certainly quite a few similarities, but, but not, not the same. And I think both your clinical presentation and also Dr. Ross Levine's data mm -hmm. shows that the same um, immature blast becomes a mature neutrophil and sure. still carries that mutation. Yeah. But in terms of what message you can send out to the community oncologist in terms of doing these kinds of studies? So I would say the most important thing is to look for IDH mutations at this point um, because it's not something that is still routinely done in the community. And you know, 20% of patients may benefit. Once, once at this point in time, once a patient fails a cytarabine-based chemotherapy and a hypomethylating agent-based therapy, there's not much in the community that can be offered at that point. And so identifying a targetable mutation that has a very um, kind of strong clinical trial behind it that, that is, is uh, certainly benefiting um, almost the majority of patients is, is, um, is definitely worth checking. No, absolutely. I agree since we have uh, patients in common. Going back to Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Ravandi, uh, obviously the, the, if you look at the, the, the low risk, the good risk patients, they do very well, including your data that you've shown in APL. But the normal karyotype, which is what we are talking about having this discussion, and FLT3 still plays a major role, a DNMT3 still plays a major role. NPM1 still plays a major role, and we were just alluding to uh, mm -hmm. FLT3. So where are we with FLT3, especially with the presentation from Dr. Chris Rolig's data? There are several FLT3 inhibitors, and unfortunately, we still haven't learned how best to use them, but I think FLT3 mutated AML, um, the whole landscape will change, uh, hopefully in the near future, when some of these studies are coming to uh, maturity and we will know how best to combine these drugs with and actually I think the same true is the same is true for IDH inhibitors uh, uh, I think the other big important thing is we still don't know how best to use them and uh, uh, important of referring patients is not just for them but also for us to improve on what we have with these uh, single agent monotherapy uh, and try to combine them and, and actually benefit patients even more significantly. Uh, so um, uh, hopefully, uh, and also this is probably going to be true in a number of other agents that hopefully will come down the pipeline in the near future. And as I said, uh, it's probably not just going to be based on a single mutation, and at least in the majority of patients. Mm -hmm. In some there may be, but in the majority of patients we will have uh, pathway-driven uh, uh, treatments using perhaps combination of agents. So molecular-based approach uh, for AML, at least in the chemo-resistant uh, varieties. And, uh, with monoclonal and antibodies, and yeah, there's, I mean, it's not just molecular, that certainly is part of the, <coughs> part of the equation, I think, but there are um, certainly, you know, we were also talking today about CD33, and there's also CD123 monoclonals in addition to kind of our, our standard chemotherapy regimen. So hopefully all of these will be able to be kind of incorporated in the best um, paradigm. In that sense, uh, Dr. Wandi, you, you did a lot of work in gemtuzumab, ozogumycin, and did presented the uh, meta-analysis, and it's, it's sort of like the phoenix, it's coming back, and, uh, <laughs> and you have different iterations of the antibody, and obviously you, you stand vindi uh, you know, vindicated in this sense. and. Uh, I, so I think that goes back to the um, FDA thinking and, you know, when the first study of, the randomized study of gemtuzumab came out and it was very clear that it benefited uh, favorable cytogenetic patients, some people like us said that this drug should be approved at least for those patients, you know, after it had been withdrawn. 
And that's the way we will think about AML. There will be subsets that there are some drugs that would be beneficial for. Uh, obviously, there are major challenges, as was uh, discussed in the meeting, in terms of uh, how do we find enough patients for these small subsets to do randomized trials if you're going to still go to FDA with the uh, you know, uh, previous paradigms. But uh, I think many of these will be solved with new designs of uh, trials, with new uh, endpoints that would be acceptable to FDA for drug approval. And I think the cost of drugs are also an imp are important issue that will have to somehow be solved uh, because as we have seen in other diseases, we are extending some of these uh, patients' lives for many years. Mm -hmm. And if they're going to be taking these agents for many years, the costs will have to come down in order for the whole uh, society to be able to use them. Excellent. And two other points that I wanted to make. One is the older patients who cannot tolerate chemotherapy. And I guess that's where a lot of clinical studies come into play. But for now, and I think a lot of community physicians still treat leukemia patients. Mm -hmm. uh, what message would you t give them for these patients? Uh, obviously, the younger patients, it's a little different. You have the question of transplant and uh, molecular targeted agents. For older patients, we should not be nihilistic. In Western societies, the life expectancy has been increasing over the years, not by being nihilistic in all aspects of medicine. We have been innovative and, you know, uh, when I was in medical school in the UK, uh, people with heart uh, disease filled the f uh, floors with uh, severe congestive heart failure, which we don't hardly ever see anymore. Uh, so, uh, and that's true uh, in oncology and in leukemia. And there are now a lot of exciting potential drugs, and I think all the older patients should be encouraged to participate in clinical trials because many of these trials are giving them a better quality of life at least and uh, many of them are actually producing significant responses with improved survival. I think what has been routinely showed is that doing nothing is worse than, than treating. And so the number one message I think for elderly AML is, is, um, is, is treating them. Trying to decide what the best treatment is, of course, is, is remains the unanswered question. And um, participation in a clinical trial, I think, is probably the best way to go at this point. We have several kind of hypomethylating agent-based combination strategies that, that we hope will be um, both well-tolerated and effective. And I would take that one step further that not just treating them is enough. Uh, you need to treat them on trials mm -hmm. because um, hypomethylating agents are widely available and it's best to give those on trials in addition of other drugs to patients who uh, are selected for those trials because we all know that once the hypomethylating agents fail, things become more difficult. So by enrolling frontline into trials, you can actually try to improve things. I know we can go on talking about AML because there's a lot of issues, but one final discussion point is the question of transplant and the risk stratification and the SORAR, the, 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 the Europeans use. So where do we stand with that considering we have all these agents and molecular pathways? I think transplant has been and will, it still is and will be for the foreseeable future is a very effective therapy in certain patients with AML. We've all looked at difficult AML populations and looked at the survival curves and you know the five to 10% that are alive 10 years on, most of them have had an allogeneic transplant. But like uh, other aspects of AML therapy, transplant is also evolving. Personally, I think transplant will, it will in some time in the future will be just cellular therapy. Uh, more and more relying on, uh, we already actually are doing that with CAR T cells and uh, other forms of cellular ther therapy that are being developed. So um, a th transplant is important, will continue to be important, but will also evolve. But selecting patients for transplant is very important and that's why again most patients should be treated in trials and in academic centers and where the transplants are performed most expertly because outcome of transplant is very much dependent on where it's done. No, I think your message is very strong in terms of trying to enroll more patients to understand the biology, 
and also participate in clinical studies with novel agents and also go have centers which do have good uh, transplant uh, outcomes. Have, with that, uh, I think we will uh, stop this discussion and many of you can look at the presentations from today's SOHO. Dr. Rawandi, thank you very much. Dr. Thank uh, Leonardo, you. thank Thanks you very, very much. much. Thank you very much.